We're gonna continue our series on the Apostles' Creed. Okay, I believe in God the Father, Almighty Creator, of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the conscious pilot, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated on the right hand of the Father. And will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Alright. Why do we, why are we studying the Apostles' Creed? Okay. It's what we believe in. And another way of saying it is that it's the basics of the Christian faith. If somebody says to you, what does it mean to be a Christian? What do you have to believe? Well, the Apostles' Creed lays out all the basics. It's great. It's kind of like when you start to learn to do math. They teach you simple equations first. Mm -hmm. One plus one, two plus two. One plus and two. in some ways, the Apostles' Creed is, and hopefully you guys by now or past those equations. No. Um, no. 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 I failed. I'm learning how to I'm in geometry. I didn't know algebra and numbers anyway. Yep. Well, that's why we're talking about this. This is, this is the basics of what it means to be a Christian. And so we're going to pick up tonight with the forgiveness of sins. And that's on the next slide here. And we sang about that in the worship songs tonight. And this is a key element of what it means to be a Christian. Because the Bible makes it clear that all human beings are sinners. And the most descriptive idea behind the word for sin in the Old Testament of the Bible, the first part of the Bible, was to miss the mark. This is, and the picture was an archer shooting an arrow, you know, bow and arrow, pull it back, it lets go, it makes that nice little noise as it hits the, comes out, it hits your hand, hits the string, etc. Well, the idea is to shoot an arrow and not hit what you're aiming at. To shoot an arrow and not hit the target. Say you've got, a, you know, the bullseye, and you, it's on a bale of hay, and your arrow doesn't even hit the bale. That's yeah. fail. Well, that's the picture of sin. To have a target, to have something you and I are supposed to be doing, or supposed to not be doing, and to fail at it, to mess up. That's what. That's a picture of what sin is. And the Bible says that all of us have sinned. Everyone. The best person you know is sin. Again and again. Because we are sinners. We are born this way. We are born in sin. And I'm not talking about a Lady Gaga song. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Well, and... Well, here's the thing, though. She's singing about the homosexual lifestyle, which the Bible says is sinful. And whether they're born that way or not, as far as being bent towards homosexuality or not, regardless, whether they're homosexual or heterosexual, any sex outside of marriage is sin, the Bible says. Yes, Abby. So, are you against same-sex marriage? Well, the Bible says that it's a sinful lifestyle, yeah. So, yes. Um, I, and, like, we can get stuck on this for a while, but I've had friends that are homosexuals, and I care dearly, deeply about them as people. Me too. But I want them to come to know God. Just like my other friends that were sleeping around and drinking and partying, I want them to come to know God too. Stop sinning. Yes, Abby. Well, yeah, well, the Bible, first of all, uh, the Bible makes no 
no um, uh, mention or allowance for two men to marry or two women to marry. And the Bible specifically says it's an abomination, or in other words, it grosses God out when two men sleep together. And that's in the Bible. I can't change that. That's God, not me. I didn't make this up. I'm not trying to hate people. But I've got to tell you, you, you know, you guys asked the question, and so I've got to be honest with you and tell you what the Bible says. Yeah, Zach. So if a homosexual was to get married and have good faith in God, would uh -huh. God still reject him? Well, the problem is that if you get... Uh, the problem is it's still a sinful lifestyle. Yeah, it's still... Okay. Well, here's the thing, though. Let's... let's Let's think about this from God's perspective for a minute. God created us, and the Bible said He made man and woman for each other. And then He told them, after He made them, to be fruitful and multiply. Well, hold on. Did God pretty much make everyone? What about that pregnant man? Yeah. Because if God made everyone, He made sure He didn't say the word gay. Okay. Well, Adam and Eve and everything. Uh, but that don't make sense. Hang on. <laughs> now, here's the thing, guys. I'm suing. I know that you guys have all been taught, and Lady Gaga has sung about "Born This Way," and they try to say, "Shh." Okay, hey guys, let's all have one conversation, and everybody be part of it. Keep talking, a little conversation that people can't hear. Um, the the studies that they point to to say that homosexuality is a born trait that you are genetically predetermined to be a homosexual are so flawed when you look at the methodology they use and everything they've done the studies are worthless they don't prove anything now does that mean that we won't eventually find out that there is some sort of a genetic predisposition towards it i can't guarantee that i don't know but the thing is homosexuality is a sin just like the Bible says that drunkenness is a sin. Doing drugs is a sin. Sleeping with somebody who's, who you're not married to is a sin. So God wants us to get sin out of our lives. And he's made a way for that to happen. Zach? Well, so then he is just rejecting his own creation. <laughs> well, no, his own creation is rejecting him and his... But, but he's pretty much making him like... No, man. no, no, no. God made Adam and Eve without sin. And Adam and Eve chose to sin. And then you and I choose to sin. It, it is a choice. And so... And... If, if God was... No, but here's the thing. If God forced us... Devin just said, you know, we can't force him. If God forced us to love Him, it wouldn't truly be love, because it would just be programmed into us. He gives, he gives us the ability to choose, and then you and I choose what happens. Heaven or hell, yes. This is from a book in the Bible called 1 John, and it's towards the back end of the Bible. And it says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, this means everyone, including you and me, in the room right now, even Pastor A, or Mr. Carroll, the deacon board chairman, or whoever it is, that they all are sinners. All of us. Would you say that? I am, my wife is, my two and a half year old daughter is. She, she uh, figured out real quick how to annoy her brother. That's not sin, that's normal. Well, why is it or isn't it sin? Because I do it too. Well, sin is normal to us. Yeah, well, exactly. Wait, what? Well, you would be the one sinning. Uh, teaching them evil. Uh, but the thing, the thing is, guys, all of us are sinners. Grace figured out Luke doesn't like to be called a bad boy. So she'll be like, you bad boy. And Luke's like, I'm not a bad boy. And then she comes back with, you bad girl. I am not a girl. Luke like, freaks out. She's two and a half. She's a girl. And she's figured out how to torment her brother already. 
And now, she doesn't know at two and a half the difference between right and wrong. She just knows how to get under her brother's skin. And how to torment him. And don't get me wrong, Luke knows how to push her around or knock her down or... Uh-huh. So, we're all sinners. And in the Bible, in the book of Romans, it makes clear that because of our sin, we deserve death. We deserve to be separated from God forever. The sent to the lake of fire. That's the penalty for our sin. But here, because of Jesus coming, living a sinless life, dying on the cross, if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then He'll forgive us. So He reminds us first that all of us are sinners, still, today. And if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us or cleanse us, wash us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar and His word has no place in our lives. So how Pretty? We, yeah, go ahead, Zach. So what do you mean by if we, like, spill out our sins? And Confess? Yeah, well, that... Where, when, how... Ah, that's a good question, actually. I was going to get there next. Yeah. The, um, the idea of confession, the actual meaning of that word to confess is basically to agree with God. In other words, if I agree with God... Yeah, you know, Lord, when I lost my temper today, that was not right. That was a sin. Please forgive me. It is to agree with what God values, with what God says. So, instead of, you guys know how it is when you do something wrong and you start arguing with your parents? Yep. How well does that go over for you? Not pretty well. Not pretty well. Pretty good, actually. And that's... Don't try to hide it. And don't try this at home, that's right. And that's the idea here, too. God doesn't want us telling Him how right we are, or making excuses. Well, she did it to me first! Yeah. Or, yeah, we all have all kinds of excuses for why we did the wrong thing. Exactly. <laughs> but to confess our sins to confess our sin is to agree with God that it was wrong to shut up and stop arguing and just say okay God I was wrong I shouldn't do that no I'm talking about you shutting your mouth instead of arguing with God or making excuses or ignoring him that's it and no it's not no. You hurt my feelings. Number one, I did not. No, no. It's if I intentionally hurt someone's feelings without cause, then yes, it would be a sin. But I didn't tell you any person to shut up. I'm saying before God, we shut our mouth, quit arguing with him. And agree with. It. What he says is right. What he says is wrong. And unfortunately, guys, there's a whole bunch of people in our society that try to argue with God. Now, one example of that is the whole gay marriage thing or living together before you're married as a straight couple. Or, yeah. What about bi? Yep. Yep. What about bisexuals? Any? Yep. Okay, here's the thing. Well, I, I understand that. But the thing is, once again, what does the word confess mean? To agree with God. If God says it's a sin, it's a sin. So remember this too. One of the things I just ran into, I was talking to a friend that I met when we used to live in an apartment here in Waterloo, and he is really been greatly hurt by people who call themselves Christians because 
they haven't been humble enough to face the fact that they're still sinners too. And so they get all up in his face and tell him he's a sinner and wicked and all this stuff. Well, here's the thing. When we do tell others about God, you need to remember that you're in the same place that they are except for your faith in Jesus. And so when I think I'm better than somebody else because I'm a Christian, what I'm saying is I'm claiming credit for Jesus' goodness on my behalf instead of facing the fact that I'm a sinner and so is everybody else in my life. And therefore, the Bible does call believers saints. It tells us to live a godly life, but we will never be completely free of sin in this life, so there's no reason for me to ever be all proud of myself or you to ever be all proud of yourself. The point to live by is God forgives us when we confess our sins. When you and I agree with God that what He says is a sin is a sin, He promises to forgive us. So be real careful about arguing with God. I know in our culture and in your schools, you are taught all the time that like the biggest, the worst thing you can do is be homophobic or be intolerant. Homophobic. Uh, homophobic means homophobia, fearing gays, or hating gays. Yeah. And, <laughs> but the problem with that is, guys, God says homosexuality is wrong. Yeah. And if I don't tell, if I don't warn people living in sin, whatever kind of sin it is, that God will one day judge sin, if I don't warn them, God actually, uh, well, let me back up here. The Apostle Paul said, I am innocent of any man's blood because I've completely, fully explained the gospel to him and the plan of God. And so, if I tell somebody that, oh, it's okay to live however you want, God can call me to account for not warning that person they were going to face his judgment. And that's kind of scary. And that's not just about homosexuality. That's about any sin. Because when it boils down right down to it, all of us need forgiveness. All of us need salvation. Here's the other part about sin. Jesus said... Okay, i got to back up and explain the situation. Okay, so they bring this woman to Jesus, these the religious leaders of the day, and ironically enough, they say, hey, we caught her in the act of adultery. That means she was a married woman, and she was having sex with somebody who wasn't her husband. And that's where the story picks up. So, well, it is bad. And uh, so they bring her to Jesus and said, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. And of course, the first question is, well, where's the guy? Because it takes... To do, to do that. So I don't know why they only brought the woman, but um, but also uh, some Bible scholars say they think that she was probably set up. But anyhow, Jesus says to them, you who is without sin, cast the first stone. Because in the law of Moses, God said anybody who committed adultery should be stoned. Should be, you throw rocks at them until they are dead. So he says, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, from now on, sin no more. Now, so this goes back to that question you guys had earlier. Well, what about somebody who says he's a Christian and he's gay and he's married to another man? Well, Jesus said right there, go and sin no more. Go and, what, another translation of this says, go and leave your life of sin. All of us are commanded by God to change how we live our lives. It's not me saying this. Jesus said this. I didn't make this up. I'm not the one 
setting the standards. It would be arrogant if I was the one doing that or if you were the one doing it because, well, you're just another sinful human being. What right do you have to tell me what to do or how to live? But if you're Jesus Christ, then you do. If you're God the Father, then you have the right to tell people how to live. So yes, if we confess our sins, he's faithful just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us. But also, Jesus himself told that woman, go and leave your life of sin. Change how you're living to line up with God. All right, let's go to the next slide here. Pretty straightforward. God commands us to stop sinning. In the picture on the last slide there, there were people actually, if you back up one, hit the back arrow here, here. This was a scene outside of the World Trade Center. These people were fleeing the destruction that happened to those towers. That's the, they're stuck in that ash cloud. And I was looking for a picture, how do I illustrate leave your life of sin? Well, it's kind of like they ran away from the death and destruction at the World Trade Center site. And Jesus said, yeah, I would run away too, yeah. Well, and Jesus would say to you, that's a picture of what sin does to your heart and your life. And so you and I need to leave our life, get away from sin in our lives. Turn to God asking for help to change how we're living. So that we don't live in the death and destruction. that sin causes. Okay, let's go on to the next section here. And this one is the resurrection of the body. God promises that He will bring us back to life. That we will have a physical body again one day, even after we die. I know this seems pretty amazing, especially like you think about people that have been cremated. I don't know exactly how this all works. This is the promise of the Bible. Now, the Bible also promises that this body won't be exactly like the one you have right now, because the one that we have right now has, like, scars and bad joints, and, like, my ankles click all the time. And, what? I don't know. I'm too short. Pastor Mark, I don't have an ankle. What? I don't have an ankle. I'm going to kill you. Um. So, oh, you don't have an angle. Yeah, I don't know. I just said uh, Okay. That doesn't make much sense. Some people don't because it's been fused together. But the point is, God promises that one day he will bring us back to life. Give us a new body. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 13 says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every one of them according to their deeds. Now, this is the part where everybody, including those who don't believe in God, are judged. Raised back to life, and then those who didn't believe in God and the forgiveness that He offered through Jesus, because they rejected... I mean, think about this. God sent Jesus. He came down here. He suffered. He lived a perfect life. Suffered and died. And then people tell him, oh, that's stupid. We don't like your plan. We would have done it differently. They tell that to God. <laughs> and then people like that tell me, well, that's just stupid. I would have done it differently. Well, yeah, but you're not God. And maybe there's something we don't understand completely about why he did it that way, why he had to. Someday maybe he'll explain to us. Maybe not. But everyone will be raised back alive. And then God will judge them based on how they live their life. Based on their deeds, it says. And they will be, those who never put their faith in Jesus Christ, will be sent to the lake of fire. Burns forever and ever of their sin. And we talked about God forgives sin, but God only forgives sin for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. 
So for those who lived on this planet and didn't come to know Jesus, didn't put their faith in Jesus, your destiny is to be raised back to life one day in the future. And live forever in a lake of fire, of torment. And that's commonly what we use the word, the English word hell to mean, but the more descriptive term is lake of fire. Where it just burns and burns and burns. It never goes out. And the thing is, the, the somewhat sobering part is everybody gets resurrected from the dead, but only believers in Jesus Christ go to heaven. Everybody comes back to life. Every person, I'm not talking about animals, we already had that discussion earlier. Every person gets raised back to life and then judged based on how they lived and whether they put their faith in Jesus Christ. And now, this again is the Apostle Paul talking. And um, he says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Now you got to understand, Paul was one of the cool people in his day. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, as he said. They were the cool religious leaders. They had all the power, the money, everybody looked up to them. And Paul turned his back on that for the sake of following Jesus Christ. He left all that. He became an outcast of his own people. In fact, the evidence suggests that Paul may very well have been married, but that his wife left him because of his faith in Jesus. I mean, this wasn't an easy decision. This cost him a lot. But now he's explaining to us why he would make this kind of sacrifice. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them all as rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. And actually, that word rubbish there, in the Greek, means dumb. I count all of my former successes in life, all of my trophies, my ribbons, my straight-A report cards, I count all as valuable to me as dumb. Yes, but very descriptive. He was trying to make a point. What was valuable to him. And it wasn't his stuff. It wasn't his stuff. It wasn't his social standing. He goes on, And may be found in him, in Jesus Christ, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, in other words, doing just doing right and wrong, or just avoiding wrong, doing right, because the Bible makes it clear all of us are sinners. None of us can be perfect enough to be saved on our own good deeds. Um, He says, not having a righteousness derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. In other words, the only way to be forgiven is to put your faith in Jesus, to believe that He is who He said He is, and that He has the right to tell us how to live, and that He forgives sin for those who believe in Him and those who confess. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. Christianity is not supposed to be easy. It is not supposed to be simple. Paul makes that clear here. It will cost you things. When you tell people, well, no, I have to say what the Bible says. The Bible says... Any sex outside of a man and a woman married before God is sin. The Bible says, no, it's not okay to smoke pot. It's drugs. The Bible specifically bans the use of drugs. The Bible also says, 
Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. It bans drunkenness. All of these things are put there by God to protect us from destroying ourselves. Because people do all kinds of damaging things to themselves when they're drunk or high. People get diseases, all kinds of diseases, by sleeping around. And God wants to protect us from that. But people get all bent out of shape and, oh, I want to live however I want to live. God's trying to protect you and He's put His rules and laws in place for a reason. that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings and be conformed to His death. In other words, putting aside what I want and living the way God wants me to live. In order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. In other words, that He is living his life specifically with that in mind. That he was living each day thinking about what's to come in the future. And I try to do that, guys, and I would challenge you guys to do that too. To realize that everybody around me that doesn't know Jesus before they die ends up coming back to life and going to the lake of fire one day. And that God promises to reward everyone who lives for Him. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. we got a brief video here we're going to play a couple minutes of. And uh, it's just a modern illustration of somebody who's willing to sacrifice and put themselves through all sorts of hardship because of a goal. Before a man is trained to be a Green Beret, he must prove he's cut out for the job. This is Special Forces Assessment and Selection. Survive two weeks in hell, and maybe they'll take you. Heck yeah, wake this up! What are you talking? We don't need you! Don't come to this interview unprepared. Army Green Berets are America's experts in unconventional tactics, subversion, and guerrilla warfare. They blend with the locals, and they survive with their wits. Their motto? Humans are more important than hardware. The right man in the right place devastates the enemy. We're looking for an individual that has what I would consider the heart, the gut, and the mind to be able to do our business. 256 candidates assemble at Camp McCall, a special forces base deep in the backwoods of North Carolina. They don't know how hard it's going to be, unsure about what they expect, but they're usually pretty excited and motivated. And they expect they're fully capable of accomplishing it. Unfortunately, for over 50% of them, that won't be true. For the candidates, this is the most important 14 days of their lives. Most have trained years in preparation. I believe in life you have one chance to, to look and dig deep. See how far you can reach inside yourself, see how tough you are. I'm expecting to be challenged physically, mentally, even spiritually. I grew up watching G.I. Joe, watching Chuck Norris movies, and uh, that's what I want to do. This is where you live. You're not going to go anywhere outside this area unless you are told to by cadre or you follow the information on the whiteboard. All right. Second, this is a hula-free zone. For the next two weeks, everything they do is observed. They're always being assessed. And that's pretty much the name of the game here. There's no rank, no name. They're just a number. Everybody's equal. Everybody has the same stuff. Socks! Get him out of the bag! Let him roll them! Roll them up! 
we sometimes see people trying to bring enhancements, rip fuel, and items that'll help them perform better. We definitely don't want that in the course. But pain medications, we don't want that either because the candidates will be in pain here, and there's a chance that they could do damage to themselves if they took too much of that medication. That's how you try to sneak stuff in right here, huh? Yeah, a big pile of crap right here. There's no bottles of alcohol. You do not end your SF career over something stupid like that. Selection is run by a cadre of the Army's most experienced Green Berets. They're picking their replacements. Turn around and one. That's a bad roster number, you know that, right? Number one never makes it. All right, you're good. Go ahead. To be able to tell them the truth. After years of relentless special operations combat, they're dead serious about who gets in. All right, Kenny, look, it's that simple. All right? If you're here for a tab or to wear a beret, just go buy it, all right? If you're here because you want to be part of the unit that does special things that other people don't do, and be part of a family, part of a brotherhood, a cohesion, then this is where you belong. It isn't easy what they're doing. It is, it takes a commitment. It takes a commitment. Hey guys, it isn't easy to live for God. And I'm not trying to scare you, and I'm not saying that we have to earn God's love for us. I'm not saying that we have to earn His salvation. But I am saying in a sinful world where we live, and y'all are taught every day, homosexuality is okay, and live however you want, and it's good to do pot, and I mean, that's becoming more and more talked about in the news. And it'll be taught in school before much longer. Unfortunately, it's hard to stand up for God. But it's worth it. He says that, Paul said, I left everything else behind and chased after God because he's the most important thing. So that leads us to our last uh, point to live by here, which is, because Resurrection Day is coming, it's worth it to sacrifice and to struggle to serve God now. To live for God today. No matter how hard it is, or how many people tell you that's not cool, or whatever it is they tell you, it's worth it. Because God will reward those who live for God.